Genius of Vacation is way better than I ever expected it would have been. I didn't have high expectations for a mini game within another game. But since right now I have a left hand that is burning with the pain of a thousand suns, having something I can play with just one hand, pretty good right now. It's showtime! Many of you probably already have some experience in other card games of some kind. You might be familiar with this, but for those of you who don't, we're going to go over some basic knowledge, starting with archetypes. Typically, you have four main archetypes for card games. You have aggro, mid-range, control, and combo. Aggro wants to do a lot of damage very quickly and generally take down the opponent before they can be taken down themselves. On the opposite end, you have control, who wants to slow the game down considerably, draw a lot of cards, and get value out of the cards they play, usually ending with powerful cards or just valuable cards in general and trying to wear your opponent out of options. Mid-range is exactly as the name would suggest. It is about in the middle of aggro and control. It is meant to be the strongest in the middle of the game where aggro is starting to peter out and control hasn't quite ramped up yet. Then lastly, there's combo. Combo is, well, as the name suggests again, it basically centers around one powerful combo, usually resulting in a one-turn kill, an OTK, or just almost winning in one turn and then finishing it off after. Admittedly, for the PvE aspect of Genius Invocation, knowing these are archetypes isn't that important, but knowing what to use for the PV is kind of important. A lot of the challenges want you to win in four to six turns and not lose too many characters. In some cases, not lose any at all. For that reason, you might find some challenges more difficult with aggro because they might have troubles not losing any characters, and you might also struggle with control because their games tend to run a lot longer, and you might lose the challenges for the timers. In my opinion, if you're only concerned about the PvE, you're best off with a mid-range deck with a little bit of survival, but geared towards doing a lot of damage. Number two, another common concept among card games and something people might be familiar with is that everything has a cost. A good example is zero-cost cards. A lot of people may view them as just a free card that they should include in their decks because it's free. Well, putting that card in is a cost, playing it over another card is a cost, and drawing it over something else also is a cost. A perfect example is the Minty Meat Rolls card versus the Northern Smoke Chicken card. Relatively similar cards, all things considered, but one is extremely good for combo decks, where the other might be better for aggro, where they only need to do one more action, but they can't quite afford it. Another example is switching characters. It may cost only one, but you're still spending a turn to do it, which could be important later on. That could be the difference of your opponent going first next turn or you, which which is a very big difference. The main takeaway for this tip is around deck building, that when you're building your deck, don't put something in just because it seems free, cheap, or that it might fill the space, because you want your deck to have a concise plan that everything works well together. Just because something is zero, doesn't mean it's free. Number three is one that's unique to this card game, at least in terms of ones that I've played, and that is don't re-roll your dice just because they don't match your element. The element matching only matters if you're trying to attack or if you think you're going to attack. If you know for sure that you're going to be casting something like the Paimon card or a weapon, then all you need is three matching. You can take three Dendro die even if your characters are all Geo. It does not matter. Keep them as they are and spend those three on your Wolf's Gravestone or a Wagner card or whatever it may be. Hell, sometimes you may even want to just change up your plan for the turn entirely based on the die you rolled. You may have wanted to switch to your Shangling to use our elemental skill, but maybe you got a bunch of Cryo die and maybe it's time to switch to your Ayaka instead and just not take the risk of getting no die that's good for you. Sometimes you'll need to adapt. That's really just the nature of card games. Number four is related to the last tip, and some of you might have picked up on this, that there is a smart dice selection feature. When you're playing cards with unassigned dice, cost, it will tend to prioritize ones that aren't for your active element, but it's not always going to be perfect. Sometimes you will want to reselect what's selecting for you. There's really no hard and fast rule for this. I can't give you just an advice saying always do this or always avoid doing this. It's going to depend entirely on your own unique situation. All I'm saying is that sometimes you may want to avoid spending certain die because it's interfering with your combo and the system can't possibly know that. For example, you may want to leave a variety of die available for your Lieben card, or you may want to leave an element that the die is selecting for a different character. All you can do is watch it and make sure you're not just always using it because sometimes it will mess with your play. Plan. Number five, weapons and artifacts are costly investments that pay off over time. Weapons are pretty versatile. They can be good for adding damage to aggro decks when they need it, and they're extremely good for adding value over long games or even enabling combos entirely with combo decks. Due to the nature of card draw, you may not draw until later when it's no longer a viable choice or a smart choice to use a weapon. Now there might still be times where the die just aren't in your favor and you might not be able to do two attacks, but you could do a weapon and attack and then it would still be helpful no matter what. 
Luckily, no matter what, we do have ways to take advantage of them. We can use Wagner to cheat one out later if we don't currently have it in our hand, or we can even just turn it into a die of our current element. But in general, the weapon is going to take at least a couple uses of your skills over a couple turns to actually get its full value. Of course, it's always going to add damage, but that may be less valuable depending on the current situation. The main takeaway here is to just not always blindly equip your weapon just because it seems like a good idea. The game might literally be within one turn of ending and it just at that point might not be worth equipping it anymore unless you desperately need that one damage and one die reduction cost. Also, just don't put a weapon in for every single character you have. Some of them may not need a weapon, some of them may not want it, you might not also have room in your deck or weapon cards for other characters. You may just want to focus on your main damage dealer or your main combo piece, whatever it may be. It's not good when you have a handful of weapons and you really only want to be on one character at a time and more importantly you can only use actions on so many characters at a time and also it goes without saying that this all applies to artifacts too even though i've been mostly focusing on weapons number six card draw card draw card draw it is one of the most important and consistently powerful aspects of any card game aggro decks need it for fuel Combo decks needed to get their combo pieces and control decks needed to keep getting answers and help control the battle. We don't have much of it right now, but in my opinion, pretty much any of the cards that draw cards should be auto included in your deck. More importantly, if you know for sure that you are going to play a card that draws cards during your turn, do that first because it may give you options that would have changed what you did. You don't want to draw cards at the end of your turn and then say, oh damn, if I had this, I could have done this instead. You want to draw cards to know your options immediately. Immediately. Number seven, do not load your deck up with support cards. We have a lot of powerful support cards that have very powerful effects. And unfortunately, we only have four slots to use them. So you don't want to end up with a whole hand full of them and a whole support section full of supports. Replacing them is not ideal unless you're done with its effect. If you equipped a Wagner early on to get a Wolf's Grace down off for essentially two mana instead of its three, that's totally fine. Then you can replace Wagner because he may not be useful anymore. But if you still need him for weapons later on, then you may not want to replace him. We have extremely powerful support cards that aren't meant to be permanent, such as Timmy or Lieben, and they are very strong cards when you get them at the beginning. We also have other support cards that are meant to help combos, such as the Don Winery. It can be very tempting to put a lot of these in your deck because they sound good, but you just don't want to be in a situation where you have too many and you either have to start converting cards because you just can't find use for them or to replace one because you really need it but you also kind of needed the other ones effect number eight here is a small handful of cards that i believe are just extremely powerful very generically good cards that can be pretty much thrown into any archetype and do their job very well starting with strategize for card draw pretty much add this to any deck two copies of it it's very straightforward the paimon card for die generation. You pay three mana, but you essentially get four die overall, but these are wild card die, so they're extremely useful. They also allow you to turn a bad turn into future good turns. This is a very good piece for pretty much any kind of deck and essential for combo decks. Star signs for taking advantage of turns where you have really bad die rolls and you just can't use any of your skills because the die are matching and you don't want to convert your cards to things. This allows you to generate energy while using those mismatched die. Timmy and Lieben are two strong turn one plays that you should consider adding to your deck. Timmy, especially if you get them on turn one, do not mulligan them away. Keep them in your hand and play them immediately. They will get value a little bit more on Lieben later. The Knights of Favonius library is very good for consistency. It's going to help you get the die you need, especially when you have very expensive bursts that need something like five pyro die. I would say it gets its value relatively quickly as long as it prevents you from even having to convert one card into a die. Lastly, Don Winery. Don Winery is a very good card that pays for itself in just two character swaps over two turns, but every time you swap after that, it's just pure value. And sometimes being able to swap off without worrying about what die you're spending can be a very strong effect that can either make or break some combos. You can also combine it with Catherine to have a strong combo that allows you to swap out characters as a fast action for free once a turn, which can make some really strong burst damage. The only downside is you are spending two of your four support slots on this combo. Number nine, do not sleep on the NRE and food combo. Now, a lot of people might sleep on the food as a whole because it's it may not be as exciting as some of the other cards, but food can be very strong for combo setups with something like the minty meat rolls, stalling with some free healing that's relatively cheap in control decks. But most importantly, this combo gives you consistent card draw that feeds off of itself, and also that card draw will be thinning your deck out, increasing the odds of you drawing specific cards. Number 10, this tip kind of overlaps with number nine, a little bit and that is consider adding cards that benefit from having leftover dice at the end of a round. I've mentioned Lieb 
than a couple times already and he is exactly such a card. Food cards do this wonderfully because most of them cost one die that means they can be very flexible and take advantage of those die you leave out at the end of a turn when you can't quite use a skill yet. Without cards like these to utilize that last die the only thing you can do is swap a character which sometimes you may not want to do. Either you want to be on the character you're currently on to start your next turn or you don't want to swap to another character because it might put them in danger or something. You want to try to use every resource at your disposal because it's just value efficient. Sometimes you may want to end your turn with die left over just because it is strategically beneficial for you to be the one starting first. It'll all depend on the situation, much like many things in card games. That's all. I hope you enjoyed watching this for the what I imagine is going to be a very small group of people actually watching a video for tips on a mini game that I released two weeks ago. I hope you learned something from this video. I hope you enjoyed watching it. I hope you have fun with the card game. Play it. Talk about it. Let them know that people love this and that it grows and doesn't just get forgotten about like some other features in this game, sadly. But what doesn't get forgotten about is my members and my patrons. They are fantastic people. They are the best. Thank you to them for supporting me. Thank you to you for watching this video. I hope my hand hurts ne less next week and I will see you in the next one. Attaboy!